Good morning, everybody. My name is Corey. Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Today, we're going to talk about Ripple, XRP, and the level playing field. A brief overview of the world solution to international trade and a global currency. If you enjoy today's work and you got something out of this video, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comment below. And if you'd really, really feel good today, I would really appreciate it if you guys could send a tip. Uh, use the QR code that's in the top left. That's my XRP TipBot account. Um, and let's get on with today's video. XRP is the greatest digital asset ever created. Um, it's used by Ripple as a means of exchange on their network and can be used to reduce costs when converting money, no matter what the type of currency conversion. Ripple is not a blockchain. Um, it's actually called the Ripple Protocol Consensus Algorithm. And uh, in this little blurb right here, I've pulled this directly from the Ripple white paper. The link is in is right there. If you guys are looking at this, you can actually go check out the Ripple white paper by clicking right there on the link. While several consensus algorithms exist for the Byzantine General's problem, specifically as it pertains to distributed payment systems, many suffer from high latency induced by the requirement that all nodes within the network communicate synchronously. In this work, we present a novel consensus algorithm that circumvents this requirement by utilizing collectively trusted subnetworks within the larger network. We show that the trust required of these subnetworks is in fact minimal and can be further reduced with principled choice of the member nodes. In addition, we show that minimal connectivity is required to maintain agreement throughout the whole network. The result is a low latency consensus algorithm which still maintains robustness in the face of Byzantine failures. We present this algorithm in its embodiment in the Ripple protocol. Now, that math equation that's a little bit to the right right there, that's taken also directly from the white paper. I have no idea what it means. I am not a mathematician. I am just a good presenter of information, hopefully. Ripple Labs, XRP, and OpenCoin. So all the way in the beginning, um, OpenCoin is the open source uh, code that was used to develop the XRP token. Um, Ripple is built upon an open source real-time set gross settlement system, OpenCoin.com, where the concept was originally made by Ryan Fuger in 2004. Um, I'm a web and decentralized systems developer and consultant, a founder and founder of the original Ripple project, now carried at ripple.com. That is taken directly from ryanfuger.com, his website. Um, but basically they came up, he came up with uh, this uh, real-time gross settlement system. And then Jed McCaleb and David Schwartz approached Ryan Fuger with their digital currency idea in September of 2012. Um, and then the three of them all became co-founders of the company and well all, all three of them kind of headed the company but Jed McCable and David Schwartz became co-founders of the company after they asked uh, Ryan Fuger to hand over the company to them um, so they can continue with uh, their, their plan Uh, the original think tanks of Ripple, after the deal with uh, Ryan Fuger, Jed McCaleb, David Schwartz, and Chris Larson, uh, were the original three creators of Ripple Company. Uh, Jed McCaleb is an American programmer and entrepreneur. He's a co-founder and the CTO of Stellar. You're right, because he doesn't any longer work at Ripple. In fact, I think that was only a relationship that lasted a couple of months after they got the coding done. Uh, Jed McCaleb wanted to take it into a different direction. It was not uh, a, a good idea among the rest of the crew, so they got rid of him. Anyway, he is a co-founder and the CTO of Ripple uh, and Stellar. Uh, McCaleb founded and served as the CTO of a company uh, called uh, Mt. Gox, which is an online Bitcoin exchange. If you guys don't know what Mt. Gox is, Mt. Gox was the... Uh, ground zero for the largest Bitcoin hack in history. Um, the site was originally created as a Magic the Trading Card Game website, but soon took on to digital currencies. I guess that after that happened, nobody decided to go and uh, double check the security of the website, and thus a bunch of people lost a bunch of money. 
Um, David Schwartz is a chief technology officer at Ripple. David is one of the original architects of the Ripple Consensus Network. Prior to joining Ripple, David Schwartz was chief technical officer for Webmaster Incorporated, a Santa Clara software developer. He developed encrypted cloud storage and enterprise messaging systems for organizations like CNN and the National Security Agency. Known as Joel Katz, he is a respected voice in the digital currency community. Uh, yeah, so here's a guy who is the chief technology officer at Ripple and his prior experience was working for the NSA. Guy knows what he's talking about. Chris Larson is an executive chairman of the Ripple board of directors and former CEO and co-founder of Ripple. Prior to Ripple, Chris co-founded and served as CEO of Prosper, a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace and Elon, a publicly traded online lender. During his tenure at Elon, he pioneered the open access credit scores movement by making Elon the first company to show consumers their FICO score. Uh, this guy has constantly been uh, a leader in the freedom of banking and currently working with the company Ripple to try to uh, make the world more of a free banking world. The guy's really making some moves across the, uh, across the web and across the world. These guys are going to, uh, these guys are going to change the world one step at a time. Ripple and XRP. What are they aiming to solve? Well, the underlying infrastructure in today's banking system is dated and flawed. It's actually called SWIFT, but we'll get into that in a couple extra slides. Ripple connects banks, payment providers, and digital asset exchanges via RippleNet to provide one frictionless experience to send money globally. Using Ripple, banks can help global companies send on-demand payments around the world without fail. Uh, this picture to the right is taken directly from the XRP ledger as of 9-11-2019. It shows that Ripple's XRP ledger has completed 50 million on-time perfect transactions without fail. And each one of those transactions, each one of those 50 million ledgers, contains between 1 and 1,500 different transactions. So uh, it is quick. It is stable it is trustworthy um, bank customers can send money to their loved ones in any emerging market like mexico india thailand and argentina just to name a few customers have optional access to source liquidity using the world's fastest and most reliable digital asset for payments xrp so xrp is aiming to solve the world's liquidity crisis by providing a instant means of exchange for global currencies is the way i take it swift is the society for world bank interbank i really want to get that slide to come out correctly but it's not all right, SWIFT is a society for worldwide interbank financial telecommunications. It is a vast messaging network used by over 11,000 banks and other financial institutions to quickly, accurately, securely send and receive information such as money transfer instructions. So SWIFT doesn't necessarily send money or cash back and forth. Uh, they are actually a messaging system um, that just sends money messages back and forth to banks. Who needs what, where what needs to be sent. Uh, while Swift started primarily for simple payment instructions, it now sends messages for a wide variety of actions, including security transactions and treasury transactions. Nearly 50% of Swift's traffic is still for payment-based messages, but 43% is now concerned security transactions and the remaining traffic flows to treasury transactions. So who uses Swift? Um, basically the whole globe, uh, banks, brokerage institutes and trading houses, security dealers, asset management companies, clearing houses, depositories, exchanges, corporate business houses, treasury market participants and service providers and foreign exchange and money brokers. Any single person that wants to transfer money around the world is going to use the SWIFT system at the moment. But SWIFT under the hood. What happens when one system controls the entire flow of global money? Well, sanctions against Iran. In 2012 of January, the advocacy group United Against Nuclear Iran implemented a campaign calling on SWIFT to end all relations with Iran's banking system, including the Central Bank of Iran. So showing that in situations where we are concerned with war and weapons we have the ability to cut funding immediately to an entire country 
the U.S. control over transactions within the EU. On the 26th of February, 2012, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but basically this Danish guy um, was traveling in Denmark and he purchased um, <clears throat> Cuban cigars for $26,000. And then when he was traveling back into the United States, they seized the fund. I'm sorry, it wasn't even in the United States. The guy was in Denmark and they seized $26,000 worth of funds because they noticed that he had used them to buy Cuban cigars with the funds. Um, so that's a level of, uh, of control. That is, um, they're able to see those large transactions all the way around the globe no matter what. So it, it's kind of scary. Um, monitoring the NSA. Reported in 2013, the National Security Agency widely monitors banking transactions via SWIFT as well as credit card transactions. The NSA intercepted and retained data from the SWIFT network used by thousands of banks to securely send transaction information. So the, uh, the, the system that connects the entire world's monetary flow is also connected directly with the NSA so they can watch every kind of transaction that's happening around the world so that they can stop things like a guy buying $26,000 worth of Cuban cigars. Um, in 2016, an $81 million theft from the Bangladesh Central Bank occurred. Um, and in May 2016, Banco del Ostro in Ecuador sued Wells Fargo after Wells Fargo honored $12 million in fund transfer requests that had been placed by thieves. Um, these are banks that are connected to the SWIFT system. So if SWIFT can catch a guy selling or buying $26,000 worth of Cuban cigars, how could they... Uh, how couldn't they stop an $81 million theft from the Bangladesh Central Bank? Or how could they honor a $12 million fund transfer to thieves out of a Wells Fargo bank located in Ecuador? Um, the point is, is that they, they have to allow it. They are either allowing it because we clearly see from this previously stated uh, message from February 12th, uh, they can get down to the nitty gritty as far as individuals are concerned. So, so they're definitely allowing these major um, losses to happen. Banks, let's get off of SWIFT for a little while. Now, in order for banks to currently have the global mode of transfer that they have, they have to have something called Nostro Vostro accounts. Nostro account refers to an account that a bank holds in a foreign currency in another bank. So it's basically like if Mexico had a bank in, uh, if Mexico had an account in Chase Bank in the United States, okay? So if, if a resident of Mexico makes money in the United States, they can deposit that money into the bank and that bank can then transfer the money that they're holding to um, Mexico for their families. Uh, the problem is that it takes a long time. It's very complicated. Um, uh, but let me just finish reading these slides for you. Anyway, a Nostro account refers to an account that a bank holds in a foreign currency in another bank. Nostros, a term derived from the word Hours are frequently used to facilitate foreign exchange and trade transactions. The opposite term, vostro, derived from the Latin word yours, is how a bank refers to the accounts that other banks have on its books in its home currency. A nostro account and a vostro account typically or actually refer to the same entity but from a different perspective. For example, Bank X has an account with Bank Y in Bank Y's home currency. To Bank X, that is a nostro meaning your account on our books, while bank Y is a Vostro, meaning your account on our books. These accounts are used to facilitate international transactions and to settle transactions that hedge exchange risk. So each bank basically holds each other's foreign currency so that people living in that country can um, earn money and then 
send the money that they have made home into their home country's currency so that their family can use it. And the banks use SWIFT um, as a way to collect that money, transfer it to the other country, and then convert it. The problem with Nostro accounts is that the U.S. bank also runs the risk by being either long or short on a particular foreign currency or by maintaining undue gaps. Losses could result if that currency appreciates or depreciates significantly or if the bank must purchase or borrow the currency at a higher rate. Excessive Nostro overages and shortages should be avoided by entering into spot and forward exchange contracts to buy or sell Nostro inventories. So um, Nostro and Vostro accounts um, are only supposed to be used for incoming cash. Uh, so the idea is that these accounts that all these banks hold are just tying up trillions and trillions of dollars that could actually be used for, uh, for purchasing power for citizens around the world. Um, but banks, in order to make money and to avoid risk, they take these foreign exchange accounts and they trade them on the uh, Forex markets in order to try to get better profits for falling or for falling value of currencies or for currencies that are gaining in value. Um, what you have in recent times, uh, and I want to give you the definition of this before I uh, just give you the example, but a currency crisis is a situation in which serious doubt exists as to whether a country's central bank has sufficient foreign exchange reserves to maintain the country's fixed exchange rate. The crisis is often accompanied by a speculative attack in the foreign exchange market. Um, so we've heard about this recently in the news. Uh, 2018, Argentine... Uh, monetary crisis with a, was a severe devaluation of the Argentine peso caused by high inflation and increase in the price of the United States dollar at local markets and other domestic and international factors. This is just a small example of, it's actually a big example, but um, I think this is, a, is a still a continuing problem. Argentina, um, the inflation in Argentina overnight went to like 60% and all of a sudden like a bottle of water that would have cost you a dollar now cost you 50 um, so the value of money in that country just disappeared because uh, all of a sudden there was no purchasing power. Now, if that happens to a Nostra account, that, that the money in that account all of a sudden has no purchasing power. So if, if the United States holds billions of Argentine dollars into an Argentine account, they can no longer make any money on that, even trading on the Forex markets, because it's lost all of its purchasing power. It's lost all of its value. So in turn, the U.S. has just lost a ton of money because there is no more value in what they're holding. The remittance market. The remittance market. Let's just say the remittance market, if you don't know, it's basically people sending money back and forth to their families. If you're um, a person who lives in Mexico and you work inside of the United States because you have a better... You know, you can get a better job, you earn that money in the United States, and you send it back home to your family in Mexico. That's remittance payments. Um, but according to the World Bank, $754 billion was sent in remittances globally in 2016. That is two years ago, okay? The numbers are growing. The global average rate for spending $200 was 7.1% as of Q3 in 2017. Again, um, I know the fees are dropping a little bit, but definitely not to a level that uh, would mark the age of a new technology coming out. Banks are and have always been by far the most expensive method to remit money compared to money transfer operators uh, like MoneyGram and Western Union, but banks charge an average of 10.6% to transfer money anywhere in the globe. Um, and I don't have this on here, but I am a member of Chase Bank, and I looked at Chase Bank's money transfers globally, and if you are a member of Chase Bank, it's going to cost you $45 to send any amount of money anywhere, and if somebody sends you money internationally and it arrives in your account, Chase Bank is going to take $15 from you just for somebody sending it to you. Um, so that's baloney. Uh, left, right here, we've got an image to depict uh, cross-border payments. And those arrows are showing that there's a bunch of land missing, as in like entire countries are not even 
allowed to receive remittance payments. Uh, they're not even part of the SWIFT network. The SWIFT network is literally a couple of member countries. Uh, if you look at the globe picture that I have on the right in comparison to the map that I have on the left, you can really see how much, how much um, is not a part of the banking system. There's really just so many unbanked people and Rickbull and XRP are really going to be able to solve this. Um, that map in the lower left hand corner, I don't know if you can read it, but it's it's actually from 2019. It's from this year. So even this year, you can see that the average um, the average cost of remittances in, in parts of countries that can still receive it are upwards of 25% of the total dollar that they're sending, which is outrageous in today's world. Imagine if you had to send 10, you had to send 100 bucks to, um, to, to Africa, all right? And it was going to cost you 25%. So right off, let's, let's say you're going to send $100 to Africa through Chase Bank. Okay, it's going to cost me $45 to send it, probably, and then it's going to cost another $15 for them to receive it. So it's going to cost me 60 bucks to send 100 bucks. That's outrageous. All right, so how long and how much does it cost? Well, several factors influence the time it takes for funds to reach an overseas account. However, the standard time for most international transfers, according to SWIFT, is one to four business days. So whew, that is a long time, especially if you send it on like a Thursday or a, a Wednesday and you got to wait till Monday or Tuesday to receive your funds. What if you needed those funds three days before you asked and now you're just in a tight space because you had no other, no other way of, of getting them? That's outrageous. Um, to send $100 internationally via the SWIFT network, it would cost an average of $13.33. Uh, that was a number that I pulled um, off of FXO just to average it out. Uh, that's just Swift's numbers, not in comparison to the Chase numbers that I had said earlier. Um, but if you wanted to send that same $100 internationally via Ripple's XRP, it would only cost you 0.00025 cents. The current minimum transaction cost required by the network for a standard transaction of Ripple is 0.0001 XRP. And I believe that's like with any amount of XRP. It's really just not, it's not changing. The value, the, the, the transaction fee is almost constant depending on the amount of XRP you're sending. Um, and the transaction cost is not paid to any party. The XRP is irrevoc irrevocably destroyed since no new XRP can ever be created. This makes XRP more scarce and benefits all holders of XRP by making XRP more valuable over time. Have I said XRP enough? So um, basically anytime a transaction is made, a uh, small 0 0.00001 XRP is burned, destroyed, never to be seen again. And over a period of time, what that does is it helps increase the value of XRP. Okay, I've got a couple slides coming up. Uh, this was, the next four slides were done by uh, a guy on Twitter. If you haven't uh, followed him please go to Twitter following the link above and follow him he's done some really good work on putting these slides together and um, so I wanted to use them in my presentation so <clears throat> eco-friendly currencies now these next four slides uh, basically show the difference in energy consumption cost and usability for XRP as it is in relation to Visa uh, Ethereum blockchain and Bitcoin blockchain. So on the very first slide that we have here, we have your annual electricity consumption. Uh, these are terawatt hours, TWH, terawatt hours. Um, at the bottom it says, how many, how much is one terawatt hour? Scotland has a population of a little over 5 million and requires 25 terawatt hours of electrical energy each year. So, Bitcoin. So what you can see here in um, in these numbers is that each one of these numbers is is in terawatt hours. So Bitcoin takes 26.05 terawatt hours per year to run the network, whereas Ethereum takes 9.68 terawatt hours. Visa takes 0.54 terawatt hours, and Ripple's XRP costs 0.005361 terawatt hours to run per year. Um, looking at the uh, small 
visual that is to the right, you can see that Bitcoin essentially takes up a third of all the power in the United States in order to keep running, uh, and more than all the power in Syria, Ecuador, and Nigeria to keep running, and then more than all the power of Apple, Facebook, Google, and Amazon combined to keep running. Um, XRP is f is absolutely and totally 100% fractional in, in any type of electrical consumption, making it far more efficient to use for a long-term basis. This is also um, uh, kilowatt hours uh, to show you uh, how many kilowatt hours are being used and how many households could be powered by uh, the use of these blockchains. Like how, in comparison to how much electricity each one of these blockchains uses, how many houses could in fact be powered instead? Um, so Bitcoin is proving that two million four hundred twelve thousand thirty-seven houses could use could be powered each year um, by by how much power the Bitcoin network consumes. Um, you can see all the other numbers, but I want you to just take a look at Ripple and see that Ripple could basically keep a street running in the United States, um, and that is just absolutely minimal power consumption. Uh, think about 50 houses. The power of 50 houses could run a, a global monetary system. That's awesome. That's absolutely incredible. Goodbye, Bitcoin. You're just clunky. Um, this is uh, another example. Um, you know, these are just trying to put the amount of consumption and power into relative terms, so that you guys and girls and ladies can, and and men and everybody can can understand the amount of power that all of these cryptocurrencies are using in comparison to each other to our and to our current systems. Um, so here's a here's a for 220 million transactions. I'm wondering if 220 million transactions is the yearly yeah, maximum per year. So maximum transactions per year, hypothetically. Um, you know, you would use, you'd be able to drive 115 million miles in a car for Bitcoin to use its annual transaction volume, whereas you'd be able to use basically like the lease miles on a regular car for XRP. So it, you're just, the fuel that Bitcoin takes is just, it just doesn't, make sense for our current economic system or energy system because we, we talk about energy crises all the time we talk about using up our resources all the time well who's going to invent a monetary system that uses a third of all of the energy in the entire globe nobody we just can't afford that as a species we actually it would be more affordable as a species to be smarter as a species to use xrp because it is less detri detrimental on the long-term effect of energy on our globe period okay let's get down a cold hard cash here um what does it cost in energy usage per year to run the bitcoin network <clears throat> per year it costs 3.12 billion dollars in energy whoo and $14 in one transaction to use the Bitcoin network. All right, Visa, it costs Visa $65 million a year to run their network. Now, I'm not sure, but I think Visa could drop that price down if they fired a bunch of people. But the point is, is that you still need a whole bunch of people running the network in order to keep it up. Um, but if you look at XRP, you can see that it's just like not applicable. 0 0.064 million dollars or 0 0.000136 dollars per transaction it, it's it's fractions of a penny fractions of a penny almost no cost that's what we need cheap almost no cost very easy on energy to run all right super fast it covers all the bases xrp is just a better technology these days okay now there is an issue that comes up all the time i hear it all the time of Bitcoin being decentralized and XRP being centralized. But after all of the information and the different um, research uh, roads I've taken, I'd like to say that w Bitcoin is centralized and XRP is decentralized. Now, Ripple is a company. Ripple is a, has a board of directors. Ripple, you could say, is centralized because of that. Ripple is not XRP. Ripple just helps the XRP ecosystem. 
So XRP itself is a decentralized um, cryptocurrency. Anyway, uh, so what is centralized? Uh, well, to centralize is a verb. It means to form a center, to cluster around, uh, to bring to a center or consolidate, uh, to centralize all the data in one file, or to concentrate by placing power and authority in a center or central organization. So now that we know what to be centralized is, let's take a look at Bitcoin's mining pools. It would take anyone with a 51% or more control of the Bitcoin network to control the network for a small period of time and interject any kind of new code, reverse spending, or adding blocks to the Bitcoin blockchain. Currently, China holds more than 71% of all the hash power and mining of BTC. Um, kind of scary. China is home to four of the five largest Bitcoin mining pools over the past year. As of the 29th of March, 2017, the distributed distribution of hash rate was as follows. Now, think about the fact that there is far more, okay, at the, two years have gone by from this date. So there is far more hash power in China. Um, but then going on ant pool, F2 pool, BTC, C pool, and BW's pool combined have a 59.5% control over the network. And that's just the top four pools. Okay. There are other pools inside of China that contribute more hash power. Um, but just those four alone contribute more than 51%, which means that those four could get together and, con and they could conduct a 51% attack on the, um, block, the Bitcoin network. Now, Ripple is decentral. I have more to talk about the China instance with uh, Bitcoin centralization after this slide. But Ripple, XRP, Ripple's XRP, um, those using XRP and the XRP ledger are able to make progress without mining. Okay, there's no mining into the XRP um, consensus algorithm. Uh, all of the XRP was pre-mined um, because they, they recognized the fact that mining causes centralization. The person, the country that has the cheapest resources to mine will overall um, have the most interest in mining because they'll be able to get more for less. Uh, saving significant computer and power, computing power and time. Also, a built-in system called fee escalation is part of a consensus protocol and helps to regulate fees overall. This means lower costs, faster transaction times for XRP compared to other digital assets, the attributes that make it the most useful asset for settlement. Now, Bitcoin has been called the most useful asset for a store of value and uh, go for it, but not, not for um, an actual useful settlement case. Uh, the XRP ledger requires 80% of the validators on the entire network over a two-week period to continuously support a change before it is applied. Of the approximately 150 validators today, Ripple runs only 10. I actually believe it's less. I think it might be seven right now, but 10 for here. Unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, where one miner could have 51% of the hash power, each Ripple validator only has one vote in support of exchange or ordering a transaction. The XRP ledger is, and always has been, inherently decentralized because the users always retain the freedom to change their UNLs and the corresponding validators that they trust. For example, if a party controlling a large number of validators abused that power to propose changes that served only its own interests, users operating other nodes could simply remove the party's validators from their UNLs and rely on other validators that more closely represent their interests. <clears throat> Bitcoin is a global network. If somebody takes control of the Bitcoin network, they can impose any kind of code they want without the consensus or without the support of anybody else. They simply just need the power and they can do it. Um, Ripple, on the other hand, if somebody wants to implement code, they need to basically like get together with everybody else who owns a ledger and say, is this going to help XRP? And if it isn't, they're totally voted off and the ledgers, the computers actually talk to themselves. The computers trust each other. They have to be part of the network. They have to, con uh, they have to like conduct a certain amount of transactions prior to the, uh, 
prior to them even being recognized. So they have to prove trust prior to being e prior to even being put on the network. The graphic below shows that uh, four mining groups control 58% of Bitcoin. 57% um, of Ethereum is controlled by three mining groups, and Ripple only runs 7% of the validators on the XRP ledger, which means that 93% of the entire XRP ledger is controlled by the global economy, okay? Not three or four mining groups, the globe, the world, hundreds of thousands of people, okay? Today's risks of a China-controlled Bitcoin. Okay, going back to... Um, China's control on those four main mining pools they have. The CCP, or the Communist Party of China, conspiring to rewrite history on the blockchain through a 51% attack that results in verified transactions being unvalidated and allows for fraud to occur. China, this is a hypothetical, but it is very possible, okay? It could be relevant based on the current trade and currency wars. Um, the idea was thought up and put out there by Sam I am he's on to the lifeboats on YouTube go and give him a follow he is definitely the channel to follow if you want to take a deep dive into the XRP conspiracy but China could simply send a group of troops to the mining pools in their country since they have deemed BTC illegal anyway um, they could then force the mining pools to implement code that would rewrite the Bitcoin blockchain and give control to China um, so yeah, China could literally just like get a handful of troops and send a handful of troops with a USB stick and a cool code to all these different mining pools and at gunpoint force them to implement the code. Uh, it's a very real thing. It could really happen because, um, all of these mining pools are centrally located in uh, the country of China who has a, uh, radical communist regime. So who's using XRP? <clears throat> this is the Mexican Bitso Liquidity Index. Um, this is dated all the way up until September 13th of 2019. Um, this chart right here, uh, get my mouse on the screen. This date, I have a chart next that shows the date in which MoneyGram started using XRP. Um, but this is the test runs and actual usages of XRP. Uh, after it was introduced to the Mexican Bitso liquidity index market. So this is right here before XRP was being used on a main scale, like testing and stuff like this. And this is after XRP has been used consistently. Um, it's just major volumes. Everybody loves it. Everybody recognizes the speed and the greatness of its technology. Okay, MoneyGram. MoneyGram is the deal. This is pretty much the same chart that I had before. Um, but it's got a little bit uh, more information on it. So you can uh, you can see here, um, this is the Bitstamp Bitso exchange uh, daily amount of XRP being transacted. Um, this is when uh, September 1st of 2018, when we just started talking about XRapid partners um, and XRapid, uh, Ripple's XR, XRapid program came into um, production just before july came around moneygram and ripple announced that they were in partnership and we know that moneygram wanted to use the x rapid system and when moneygram began using the x rapid system to transfer uh, liquidity around the world uh, look at the, the volumes just went through the roof which just shows the the need for for such for such a liquid digital asset, for such a fast uh, mode of transfer between money. <clears throat> Ripple investors. So Ripple has been doing some work and they have some great partnerships and some unbelievable investors. Um, but these are the original investors in the Ripple company. You have Accenture, Santander, SBI, CME Ventures, uh, Google Ventures, Standard Chartered, Seagate, Digital Ventures. Um, and we're going to move on to show you the partners of Ripple. Here we go. Boom. Look at all those partners. In fact, this isn't even, this is just the first page. I have a whole nother slide showing you how many people are partnered with, or not partnered, customers. Okay, customers of Ripple. So people who banks that have come to Ripple saying, wow, we've recognized how great your tech is and we're considering using it. 
uh, Senfren, Santander, Standard Chartered, American Express, MUFG Bank, um, Axis Bank, yeah, just all over the Earthport. We've got TransferGo, ZipRemit, World Finance, UE Exchange, TransPayGo, SBI Remit, and MoneyGram, both using the XRapid system. XRapid utilizes XRP as liquidity. All right, Ripple executives, here are the executive teams. Brad Garlinghouse is the CEO of Ripple. David Schwartz, Chief Technology Officer. We learned about him in a few earlier slides. We've got Ethan Beard, which is SVP of XSpring. XSpring is an initiative by Ripple. We're going to learn about that in a slide coming up. Um, Kaina Van Dyke, SVP of Business and Corporate Development. Ashish Birla, SVP of Product. Ron Will, CFO. Marcus Treacher, SVP of Customer Success. And Monica Long, SVP of Marketing and Communications. The Board of Directors at Ripple. Anja Manuel, founder partner at Rice Hadley Gates, LLC. Ben Losky, former superintendent of financial services for the state of New York. Chris Larson, former CEO and co-founder of Ripple. Susan Athley, professional, professor of economics at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Ken Kersen, editor-in-chief at Observer Media. Gene Sperling, National Economic Council Director under President Clinton. And Yoshitaka Katao, President and CEO of SBI Holdings. And then Brad Garlinghouse again. Now, Yoshitaka Katao, President and CEO of SBI Holdings, is sitting on the Ripple Board of Directors. I'm going to go back two slides. SBI Remit, that's the same CEO. Okay, Yoshitaka Katao, same CEO, owns SBI Remit using X Rapid and. <clears throat> on the Ripple Board of Directors. Okay, XSpring, just like I said I would come to it, is to build the Internet of Value. XSpring is an initiative that Ripple has uh, conjured up. Uh, we work with developers, entrepreneurs, and companies that use blockchain technologies to fundamentally transform money. We contribute to open source crypto protocols such as the XRP Ledger and Interledger products. We invest in blockchain startups and we partner with companies to help them grow. Ripple is constantly doing everything that they can to build on top of the XRP ecosystem and to change the way that value moves across the internet. Coil right here, received $250 million. It was at a $1 billion XRP uh, transaction to them to help them change the way that money moves across the internet. So uh, it actually imposes uh, micro payments. So instead of, instead of paying like $5.99 a month to be part of the New York Times website, um, you, would, you would in fact have uh, micro payments as you read so as you're reading the longer you're reading like a fraction of a penny would be pulled from your xrp account the more time that you spend reading the article um, but it's also great for content creators especially those um, raised in space right here is for the musicians of the world and as you know i like to produce my own music so this is great um, instead of having to get your checks from spotify or you know uh, YouTube or um, SoundCloud or things like that. Uh, anytime somebody listens to a track directly, anytime somebody that listens to your music, you get paid directly. Um, the amount of time that they spend listening to your album, you get paid in micro payments. Um, it's just a way to bring value to the cre content creator on the internet. Um, and it's going to be a trillion dollar, a trillion dollar industry. Some of the biggest companies in the world are gonna come from at the X Spring Initiative by XRP, I promise. <clears throat> okay, if you don't know, XRP is definitely shrouded in conspiracy. Um, XRP has been sought to be the next world reserve currency. Don't take it from me, there are a lot of incredibly smart people out there doing the work, doing the diligence to find things like this out. I believe it. I invest in it. I wouldn't be doing a presentation like this unless I was invested in XRP. Um, as we can see, we've got Brad Garlinghouse right here. Their yearly event 
is Swell. Swell is like the uh, the Comic Con for XRP Ripple. Uh, they come out talking about all their new technologies and how XRP is going to change the world. Well, last year, Swell, Bill Clinton, was uh, came out to talk um, about uh, XRP and how uh, and how it can help. Um, and if we did, you just saw in, a, in two or three slides earlier. Um, actually, I'll just go back really quick. Uh, here we go. Gene Sperling, National Economic Council Director under President Clinton. So all over the place, all over the place, you can see uh, these guys uh, just have this interwoven web with each other. Um, here's Brad Garlinghouse again. This is a picture taken off of a, a Twitter profile. Um, Chief Executive Hong Kong Monetary Monetary Authority is sitting with him. Chairman Saudi Arabian Monetary Monetary Authority is here. Director of Monetary Markets IMF is right here. Um, uh, Director of Monetary Markets the IMF is here, sitting with Brad Garlinghouse. The Chairman of Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority is this guy, chilling with Brad Garlinghouse. And here, right here, this is Christine Lagarde. Okay, she used to be the director of the IMF and or the chairwoman of the IMF and now as of yesterday I believe she is officially the new uh, EU Central Bank chairwoman or head of the new European Central Bank and she and Brad Garlinghouse are like practically best friends so um, one of the terms that has been played around all over the place as far as XRP is concerned and politicians have been throwing out is a level playing field, the term a level playing field. Um, and if you pay attention to any of Trump's speeches, he always comes on and he always says the U.S. will be on a level playing field with China. Well, of course, the U.S. will be on a level playing field with China. We're going to be using the same currency system called XRP. Also, we have a cool little article right here from The Economist. This Economist magazine came out in 1980. Basically, what it says is get ready for a new world currency. It shows the phoenix rising um, for October. Uh, the fiat money underneath it is burning. It's saying that basically a digital currency is going to rise up and take over fiat money. Um, who knows? Who knows? But if you want to know, there are a bunch of unbelievable smart XRP community members and this is the smartest people I'm telling you the smartest people on the planet as it comes to finance are the ones that you're going to find in the XRP community and a couple of the, the the ones that I have truly learned the best and most information for deserve their pictures on this slide and so I want to have you all go out and follow them especially if you're getting interested in XRP and you want to know more about it um, these guys have done tons of excellent research and tons of work uh, and you'll really get the picture. So follow the Digital Asset Investor, Jungle Inc. on YouTube. Sam I Am, this is To The Lifeboats. We've got Brad Kimes who does a uh, live stream every morning and evening. I don't know the morning time, but I think at night he does it at 8.30. This guy came up with something called the pre-allocation theory that proves that um, XRP is not decentralized and that XRP actually is holding, I mean, at Ripple is actually holding XRP for banks to be pre-allocated and then distributed at a certain specific time. If you haven't heard about this, it is an unbelievable dive down the rabbit hole. I love this guy. You gotta go follow him. Bank XRP um, provides probably some of the most, he just provides some great information all the time. Uh, he's all over Twitter. Uh, all of these guys work together. They're constantly in contact with each other. Love for Crypto has done definitely one of the best deep dives into XRP that I have seen. He has two two-hour-plus documentaries on uh, the inner workings of the government and how it relates to Ripple and XRP. Um, it's far more in-depth than this slide. Um, and this presentation and I hope that you've gotten a lot of great information from this presentation and it has inspired you to go learn a lot more um, DM logic is the YouTube channel however this guy I believe has a blog it's called Galgatron on the Galgatron blog um, he is incredibly smart and knows tons about the markets and technical analysis and everything and I've learned so much from him so go give him a follow and finally Alex Cobb he does a live stream every afternoon um, Eastern Time 1.30 I believe it is usually um, but 
in the event that XRP is pumping hardcore, usually he does like a marathon stream and he always puts on like uh, coverage for Swell and coverage for major events as they are related to uh, Ripple and XRP. So uh, give him a follow too. And then uh, there you see my logo right here. Uh, go give me a follow I'm on YouTube and obviously uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button and comment if you have any questions. So like, subscribe, comment, donate, help out the channel and the website so we can keep producing this great content. And uh, below is my XRP tip box QR code. So just scan that code and send some XRP my way so we can keep coming up with some great information and, uh, and uh, producing some cool presentations and following the, the changeover to a new world currency, XRP. All right, guys, I uh, hope you got a lot of good information from this and I'll see you in the next video.